Well, we're here in City Hall, in the Blue Room, about to talk to the Mayor of New York. Some say the Mayor of America now, Rudy Giuliani. Welcome. Well, I suppose you should say welcome because it's your place, isn't it? I mean, welcome, David. Yes, yes. And, and the Blue Room, this Blue Room was filled with smoke. This on the, Blue on Room the was filled with smoke, filled with soot. Uh, the carpet was white, um, and, this, and the whole building had to be abandoned on uh, September 11. Uh, every, everyone had to evacuate because a lot of the cloud, think of it as a nuclear cloud, it was a, 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 when the first building went down, a lot of the, of the cloud that was driven through the streets of the city came north. So it filled all of City Hall Park, came into the building itself, and uh, when I came back here to look at it, the next day or the day after, I don't remember exactly when, I was shocked to see the, what the, the it looked like a ghost town. It was all, all white, all over the place. And where were you, everybody asks each other that, this question, but where were you when you first heard the news? I was having breakfast at the Peninsula Hotel with uh, Dennis and Young, and we had just finished breakfast, and we were, and Denny was notified by the police that a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center. It was described as a small plane, a twin engine plane. And I think it was described as a twin engine plane had accidentally hit the World Trade Tower and that it had it created a huge fire. And this, this was within minutes of the time that it happened. So you... So I immediately got into my van, which is what I drive around in, Denny and I got in the van, and we headed down Fifth Avenue, which is where the Peninsula Hotel is, south, directly south to the World Trade Center. And as we were driving down toward it, I started thinking, I remember th and saying, we started talking about, how could this be accidental? I mean, but, um, even, if it, even if it was a small plane, how could it have gone so far off course as to hit a building? So immediately, we, we began to suspect that this was an attack right. of some kind. As I got to Greenwich Village coming down, which is a little more than halfway from where I was to the World Trade Center, it was the first time I could see the World Trade Center, I could actually see flames. And I passed St. Vincent's Hospital, and I saw all the- Neither of them had collapsed at this point. Neither had collapsed, and the second plane had, had not hit yet. I looked over and I saw St. Vincent's Hospital, which is in Greenwich Village, and I saw a lot of doctors and nurses on the street with stretchers, and it looked like a war zone scene to me. It was a scene I had never seen before in New York City. It looked to me like a scene from a war zone. They were standing there in their green scrubs with stretchers out, as if waiting, as if actually they were waiting for the casualties to be brought to them. And that was the first time I registered in my mind, this must be something really horrendous because um, they wouldn't be out there if, if they weren't getting reports that there were gonna be a lot of casualties. So I called up, again, I couldn't reach the head of emergency management and I couldn't reach the, the fire commissioner. I got the police commissioner again. And he told me they had found a command center and he t once again reiterated where to meet him. And just as I was in the process, just as I finished that call, I was watching the World Trade Center, and I saw a big explosion, which I thought was just a further explosion in World Trade Center 1. But that was actually the second plane hitting. We didn't know it when we saw it, because we were coming down from the north. So the north tower blocked the south tower. So when the plane actually hit and we saw this explosion, it appeared to us as if it, it was just the same fire exploding mm. further. Within less than a minute, within 30 seconds, we got a call on the police radio and we're told another plane had struck the t second tower and immediately all of us in the car, the two police officers, Denny and I said, then obviously it's a terrorist attack. I jumped down to the van and the the uh, police commissioner and uh, several other people, Deputy Mayor Joe Loda, came running up to me. And Joe, who's 
my deputy mayor for operations said it's terrible. It's a tremendous fire, people are trapped, and people are jumping out of the buildings. I said, I said to the police commissioner. That, that was one thing that, I mean, was the most riveting. And you actually saw it, the horror of it. You actually saw people jump out right. of the building. I actually, I looked up at that point. I looked up to the top of the tower. And I saw things coming out of the top of the building. And when I first looked up, my first impression was that Joe was wrong. That it couldn't be that people were jumping out of the building. That must be debris. So I started looking up to the top of the tower, which was an incredible thing to see, the flames coming out and the smoke coming out. And all of a sudden I saw a man, I think it was a man, jump out of a window. And I just had to stop. Even though it was probably dangerous to just stand there. I had to stop because I was transfixed. I'd never seen like this before in my life. And, I, and at that point I realized that Joe was correct that what he had described before as debris had been human bodies. And I saw this man come all the way down and hit the roof of another building, of one of the World Trade Center smaller buildings. And I, I, I remember saying, saying to myself that now we're going through an experience we've never been through before. I, I, this, is, this is like a different, we're in a different thing here that we really never have experienced before. And, we're going to have to invent our response to it. But we hadn't, this is not the part that we had planned for. And then I went up to the fire department command post, met with Pete Gancy, who was the chief of the fire department, Bill Feehan, who was the first deputy. They were running a command post, and they said, we can, we're, con we're confident that we can save everybody below the fire. And I knew that was a euphemistic way of saying, that we have to sacrifice everybody above. And I, you asked your friend, Father Judge, to pray for everybody. As I left them, as I left the fire people there, I said, I said to them, you know, good luck, shook hands with them, God bless you. And they said they were going to move a little to get out of the debris falling. I saw Father Judge walking toward the scene, and I said to him, I reached over across a, uh, like a, an island, reached over and grabbed his hand and said, Father, pray, pray for us. And he looked at me, smiled, he was a very, very handsome man, a very uh, a beautiful man, a Franciscan priest. He said, uh, I always do. I always do. They shook hands and get a little wave and he walked off and that's the last time I saw him. But then came the impact of when the when the two towers collapsed? I was in, I was in the um, police, makeshift police command center at the time uh, on the phone waiting to talk to the vice president. And I was saying his uh, secretary or, or the woman calling from the White House said the vice president is on the phone. So I, I said, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President, it sounded like the phone went out. And then the next thing I heard was someone said, the tower collapsed. I looked out of the little cubicle I was in, and my image in my mind was that the radio tower on top of the World Trade Center had collapsed. It was inconceivable to me that the entire World Trade Center would have collapsed. I interpreted tower to mean radio tower. But then I saw the desk shaking, like an earthquake, a small shake on the desk. And I realized it was something worse than that. And then one of the police officers said, maybe within a minute, uh, this is dangerous, we have to get out of here. We have to evacuate. So I said, okay. So our entourage, we all went down into the basement, passed the exit doors that wouldn't open, and finally went through like a labyrinth and found an exit door. And the janitor pushed it. And I think I have to expect that it wasn't going to open because the others hadn't opened. And when it opened, you felt this sort of sense of relief that you were going to get out of the basement. But it, it entered into a lobby, a big glass lobby. And when you looked outside, things had become much, much worse. And how many, will we ever know exactly how many people perished? Uh -uh. I don't think we'll ever know. The, um, right, right on the street, as we were trying to reestablish city government and figure out where we were going to locate it, 
and, and we still hadn't yet. We were just communicating by cell phone. I asked someone to find out for me, uh, how many casualties do we have at Pearl Harbor? How many people were at the World Trade Center? What, what, what was our, from all the logs that we have, and how many people worked there, and how many people were there? And the best we've been able to do is that there probably were 30,000 people in those buildings at the time of the first plane hit. Working, delivering, commuting. Underneath the buildings is a big transportation hub uh, involving people coming in from New Jersey, Westchester, other parts of Manhattan, Brooklyn. Right now, the best number that we have in terms of m missing and dead, confirmed dead, is about 3,100. Are there more people that we don't have records of? Pro yeah, sure, there has to be. In numbers that large. Um, so the thing that I keep saying that we have to focus on is that these police officers and firefighters and emergency workers and EMTs who did this rescued over 25,000 lives. Nobody's ever succeeded in rescuing that many no. people. And what do you think would be the right memorial for the people, for those people who died? I mean, do you think, as some say, we should rebuild two proud towers or, or what? I think the, I think the right memorial, um, artistically, I can't, aesthetically, I can't tell you what that is. It has to be something that grips the imagination and, and just focuses our attention on this event. I, I believe in the age that we live in, some of this memorial has to be interactive. Mm -hmm. It has to be an uh, uh, opportunity for people to relive this experience so that we reduce the situations where it may happen again in the future. People that relive the, uh, the lives of the people that were lost, the, bravery of the, re the stories of the bravery of the rescue workers to show that good can triumph over evil. Here, here the evil involved attacking an innocent civilian population in the most horrendous way anybody could possibly imagine. And the objective, I have no doubt, was to kill five times more people. And because of the bravery of these rescue workers and their professionalism and how well trained they were and how they were willing to give up their lives for other people, they saved a lot more people than died. People have to relive that experience, just how they did that. It's one thing to say it, it's another thing to talk about, it's another thing to talk about the firefighters who you know, remained on the 18th floor so that people could evacuate knowing that they may never get out. Uh, or uh, the people that I've read about, civilians that I know about who let other people get onto elevators so that every, all their workers could get out but stayed there until the last worker was out and therefore died. People need to hear those stories like we've heard about the Titanic and, mm. uh, or Pearl Harbor. The second thing people need to do from, from, it, from an interactive um, way of doing mm. this is the story of terrorism and out of control ideology. Um, because that's really what it is. It's out of control ideology, in this case the perversion of religion. What it can do, how it can distort the human mind, the human heart, uh, how our societies keep making the same mistake. We underestimate the capacity of our enemies, and when they're not overtly aggressive, we go to sleep, either militarily or in preparation for terrorism, how we, how we shouldn't do that in the future. We should mm -hmm. be more prepared um, as, as a world and not, and not tolerate governments that sponsor terrorism, support terrorism. I think that all has to be part of how this memorial works. And then, once you've figured all that out, then after you've figured that out, then how much economic development should you do? Should you do half of it, a quarter of it? But the main focus of this has to be a soaring, beautiful, highly informative, educational, historical memorial. Yeah. And it can be uplifting even after such That's a disaster because the heroism is an example to all. Sure. Do you think that uh, your childhood prepared you for this, for this ordeal, for this crisis? You know, your father always saying you must be the calmest person in the room and so on. And, uh, a strong religion within the family. Do you think that was 
the most important preparation you had for this? Uh -huh. I think my father was probably the most important preparation deep down. And then all the experiences of a lifetime, and having been mayor of New York City for seven and three quarter years, having been a United States attorney, an official in the Justice Department, having had to deal with um, organized crime and the danger that that would create and knowing what to, what to do about that psychologically in your mind so it didn't inhibit you from doing what you were doing. And then also, I think on a personal basis, having had prostate cancer and having to deal with it, having to deal with your own mortality and that, face the fear That was a total shock, what was it, April of last year? That was a complete shock. You had no, had no inkling, idea. no warning. I had no inkling, no warning, no symptoms, no, uh, it wasn't as if I had symptoms for four or five months and I was hiding them or I just went for a, te a test, an ordinary test, and all of a sudden I was told I had cancer and my father died of prostate cancer. So immediately it became a cause of even more emotion and concern than maybe it would have been if that wasn't the case. But I had to deal with it. I had to organize myself to deal with it. I had to figure out what I wanted to do about the rest of my life and get treated and go through a long treatment program. And I think that gave me a lot of strength. It gave me a different perspective on life. Um, so when you, face, when you face challenges that are totally unanticipated, I think you either grow as a person or you shrink. And somebody once told me, I don't remember who it was, you, you might as well grow. I mean, it's a lot better to grow than to shrink. Yeah, yeah. And I think, that, I think that's what happened to me in going through the prostate cancer. And uh, I think that's what's happened to me in dealing with the World Trade Center. Yeah. You just and, keep and, growing. And the treatment's over and you're, you're the treatment's clear. The treatment's over. I'm 100% cured. I'm in great shape. And I often think, in the strange way that you think about these things, even though it does no good, that uh, I wonder what I would have done if it happened a year earlier when, when, um, when I was going through the treatments where I had to take a nap for two hours a day and mm. would get sick. And, um, well, if you wanted to have a test about how hard you can work and how your stamina is, <laughs> yeah, you I couldn't have had a well, I had more test testing one. Um, but you, when, you, when you deal with a situation that is totally unimaginable, you invent how you deal with it. And um, all the experiences of a lifetime help you or hurt you in, uh, in dealing with it. You said once, you, you said that your cancer had made you less interested in politics, put it in a holding pattern. Does that mean that you would absolutely rule out something like a run for the presidency? I wouldn't rule anything out. What, what the combination of um, dealing with the prostate cancer, dealing with the World Trade Center says to me is that politics is not what life is all about. Maybe before that, particularly before the World Trade Center, I, my whole life was revolved too much around just politics. Mm. Now it's a part of my life. It's a, it's a healthy, good part of my life. But it doesn't, there are other things to do, other things that are more important. Um, and maybe that's no different than anybody that's in business and is a workaholic. And the, the, you, um, whether you're running a company, creating a business for yourself, in the media, right? Yeah. And you're driven by what you want to do and succeed at it. It takes a life-threatening situation to say to you, wait a second. Uh, this isn't the only part of your life. This is a part of it. It can be enjoyable, it can be fulfilling, uh, but it can't dominate it. And you said once, you said recently, in politics we spend all this time subdividing, and I've spent the last few months uniting people. That's correct. I think that the experience of the World Trade Center taught me that you have to work very, very hard to find the common threads uh, if you want to be a leader. And that um, because politics in America, in England, in a lot of the free world, politics is divided into at least two political parties and often more, people are always looking for the source of division because that's what distinguishes them. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me we have to try to organize ourselves so we, we look for the points of unity. And this attack has done that for us, and it's done it for me personally. And in terms of another attack, horrible thought, but you said on one occasion, we've, made, we've taken all the precautions we can, whether it's biological or other things. I mean, how do you approach the future in that sense? Do you fear another attack? I anticipate another attack and try as much as I can to figure out 
what it will be, where it will be, are we prepared for it, are we doing all the things that we can do to prepare for it, um, long before the World Trade Center. And one of the reasons I think our city was able to respond to it, to the extent that we responded to it well, is that we kept, we kept doing drills and tabletop exercises and, and play acting scenarios where we would bring everybody together, police, fire, health, sometimes the federal government, the state government, and play act an anthrax attack, a sarin gas attack, a bombing, a hijacking, a plane crash. We never play acted bringing down the World Trade Center. Mm. That was beyond anything we had imagined. But because we had play acted all the other things, we had at least gone through a lot of the things that we needed to know. So after the attack, we now continue to try to anticipate new things. You know, how after the World Trade Center attack, just as things were calming down, the whole anthrax thing began. But we Are you convinced by now that that was a domestic thing and no, not an overseas terrorist? I'm not convinced. You're not convinced? Um, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was either. And I don't, um, I don't make conclusions like that until I have the facts. I, d I don't think that um, until we find who did it, we're going to know whether it was a domestic situation or a terrorist situation, either domestic or foreign. I just don't think we know the answer to that yet. Will New York ever be the same again? It would be better. It already is better. Maybe some people just don't know it yet. It's better because it's spiritually a stronger place. Um, and people know it better and respect it more. The people of New York handle themselves in such a brave, determined way that they have distinguished themselves to the whole world. Very much like the people of London did during the, uh, the 1940s, during, the, during the, uh, the Battle of Britain. Now, it, in the case of New York, it was one day. In the case of London, it was over 13, 14 months. But the one-day attack was so devastating that it could have des destroyed a weaker people, destroyed their spirit. And instead, and I know, I know New York I, probably better than anyone, if certainly there's no one that knows New York better, better than I do, and not just from being mayor, but from growing up here and being a United States attorney here. And I think, you know, I put, I put half the people in the city in jail at one time or other. So. Yeah, yeah. And I know, the, I know this place really well. The spirit of this place is much stronger than in my lifetime. And my lifetime spans the end of the Second World War. It's more united. People are prouder of being New Yorkers. They, I think, realize that like a um, heavyweight championship fight, the other, the opponent has knocked them down and it, within seconds they got up off the canvas and took the best punch and are now functioning like champions themselves. So I think this city is stronger spiritually than it's ever been. That's a, that's a very exciting response. Obviously financially in terms of 79,000 jobs lost last month or in terms of uh, tourism and things like that, it will take time You've talked spiritually, which is economically. The basic, economically, it'll take ten years, perhaps. No, no, much less. No, than, much less. No. Than, for the most most important thing about a city is the spiritual part of it. The economic part will always follow from the spiritual part of it. If the if the spirit of a people is determined and optimistic, no matter what's going on in the economy, it will it will turn because right? yeah. they'll make it turn. And so with the passion you feel about New York, does it make, it must do, what's the toughest thing about having to say goodbye to the morality in a few days time to no longer be mayor? <laughs> right. What's, what does it feel like? What's the most difficult? It must be painful in a way. I mean, it was for a while, but I've, I think I've, I'm, I'm ba basically, I have a lot of passion and a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of, um, I'm operatic in many ways because I love opera, but ultimately I'm philosophical. And I've had a long time to prepare for the fact that I have term limits and mayoralty is over on December 31st of this year. And now I have kind of gone over on the other side of the mountain. I'm thinking about, you know, what am I, I going to do next year? 
what new challenges lie ahead, how I can create a, an interesting uh, future and challenge myself to do things I hadn't done before. And at the same time, I feel like I've given everything I can give to the city, that there isn't, that, that there isn't a thing that I've held back in what I can give to the job that I, that I love so much. I'm going to give lectures, speeches, and I'm going to get involved in business and create some businesses that have me involved with my friends and have me involved with people that I care about. I'm not exactly sure what they are yet, but there'll be a lot of excitement in trying to figure that, trying to figure that all out. Uh, and at the same time, I'll remain very active in politics. Uh, I will I work very hard uh, to help President Bush in any way that I can. Uh, I'll work very hard to make sure that the Republicans hold on to the House of Representatives and maybe regain the Senate. So I will, I will remain in politics, but it just will not be the only thing that I do in my life. There'll be a lot of other things that I'll be doing at the same time. Are you planning to walk down the aisle for a third time, like it says in some of the columns? Well, I think I have to, I have to first resolve, first have to resolve uh, some of my personal situation in order to make that decision. But <laughs> I, uh, I, I have a very a beautiful and wonderful relationship with, with Judith Nathan. She was a very important part of getting me through all that I dealt with with prostate cancer, both because of what she's like as a person, because she's a nurse and understood a great deal of, of what was needed. And uh, she was a real, real partner in dealing with the World Trade Center, both from an emotional point of view and then just practically in helping to set up the family center and helping me just deal with a thousand, a thousand issues. Because those are two crises, actually that it would be very tough to handle on your own without impossible, moral support. Impossible to handle it on your own. You need somebody, in order to really do it, you need somebody you love and that loves you, and you need to work with people that you love and who love you. And I have, uh, I have the most incredible group of people that I, that I work with. They're like my family. And during the World Trade Center and dealing with that, the fact that we were all family members um, and knew each other so well was a great strength to the city. My deputy mayors, the fire commissioner, police commissioner, head of emergency management, the, com the commissioners who run the different agencies, my chief of staff, my communications director, all, all of these people function together from the point of view of loving the city so they'll do anything for it and loving each other. Well, Mr. Mayor, Rudy, I can't think of anyone who <laughs> deserves more to live happily ever after. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.